Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. and welcome to Focus on Health. I'm your host, Peggy Mello. Today's guest is Robert Wolf Esquire from the law firm of Robert Wolf. Welcome to the show. Well, good morning, uh, Peggy. It's great to be here. I uh, appreciate you inviting me to talk with you. Um, why don't we start out, just talk a little bit about your law firm. What areas do you specialize in? I am a uh, certified outer law attorney, and my concentration of my practice is dealing with senior citizens, estate planning, and uh, tax planning. Okay. And I so, cross a kind of a broad parameter, but I predominate an estate planning attorney. Okay. Now, we have a lot to cover today in 30 minutes. Uh, why don't we start out with the definition of a power of attorney and what exactly that means? Okay, a power of attorney is a legal document that allows you to appoint somebody to act as your agent. Uh, it's really contract law. I mean, it's principal you know, agent. Uh, it allows, I call it planning for substituted decision making. I'm able to appoint, say, you to make decisions for me if I'm unable to make a decision for myself. Uh, they come in several varieties. There's the non-durable, durable, and springing. And they all have different little uses. But basically, it's a legal instrument to transfer authority to somebody else to make decisions. Okay, so right. in a healthcare setting, how would a power of attorney um, come into play? It doesn't. Uh, you cannot use a healthcare, you cannot use a power of attorney to make healthcare decisions. That document is a healthcare proxy. And oh, there's, 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 okay. Okay, now, if I give a talk to it, I'm talking about power of attorneys and healthcare proxies, I'll sometimes say, has anybody in this audience ever used a power of attorney to make a healthcare decision? And I'll put my hand up, because I has. But there, there's no authority in the power of attorney to make health care decisions. Okay, so just so people understand. Now, the next thing that we have to define is uh, the definition of a health care proxy. Can you do that? Very similar to a uh, power of attorney. It allows you to appoint somebody to make health care decisions for you. It's a formal document. Now, the, the big difference between a power of attorney and health care proxy uh, is with a power of attorney, you can appoint several people to be your agent at one time. And in that document, you say, well, let's say I appoint Mary Doe and John Doe to be my health care uh, attorney in fact and my power of attorney. I can say they either have to act together or separately. But with a health care proxy, I can only pick one person at a time to act for me. So in other words, if you're going to be okay. my health care agent, I could pick you, and but then I could pick a successor to you. The other aspect is the difference with a power of attorney, if you gave me a power of attorney today and you directed me to go down to the bank to make a transaction for you, I can do that. With the health care proxy, the authority is only triggered if you lose capacity and the doctor oh. certifies that you are uh, incapacitated. Okay. Now, can you define some of the situations that could be considered health care decisions that people would be doing? Oh, all over the board. I mean, for example, uh, what doctor I might want to go to. Uh, if I'm in uh, what hospital I might want to uh, be admitted to, nursing home. Um, procedures, in other words, if, uh, uh, if uh, let's say a hospital wants to do a particular procedure, the healthcare proxy agent can say yes or no. In a personal situation, uh, my father needed to have dialysis, you know, and the uh, debating and, uh, he, he did not want it to be artificially kept alive, you know. But as a healthcare agent, I was able to look at the medical records and make the decision: yes, we're going to do it. Okay, and this there can be done when somebody is out of the area or in the area, right? Today it can be. You, you know, words. I, I tell clients: pick the person you have confidence in, not necessarily proximity, but the person that you look to uh, 
uh, or have confidence to make decisions for you. Because what happens is, the, let's say somebody's in California, I mean, they can fax the, the copy of the healthcare proxy or power of attorney to the entity asking for it. They can discuss it on phone. I mean, there's, there's different ways of dealing you know, with it. So I think the, the main thing in these documents is to pick the person that you have confidence in. Okay, and how does a healthcare provider know that a healthcare proxy is on file? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> they don't. Uh, you have to make it known, you know, to them. Uh, if you, if you, like for example, let's say you do a, a healthcare proxy, you might want to give it to your doctor or somebody else. But the main thing I think is to let family members know that it's that you've done it, or give it to the person who's going to be acting for you. Okay. But if you already know who your primary care physician is, should you send them a copy? Yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Now, what, are, what is the procedure of having this done? Do you, you have to go to an attorney, I assume? Uh, no, you can get forms. I mean, if you go to a uh, stationary st uh, store, there are forms available. I, I, of course, I don't want to sound self-serving, but as an attorney, I think you should go to a professional to prepare it for you. But the basic procedure, with the power of attorney, you sign it, and your signature is notarized, and that creates it. With the healthcare proxy, you need two witnesses, and neither of the witnesses can be the person that you are appointing to act for you. And that's a major mistake oh. that many individuals, uh, you know, make. So they have to have disinterested, um, you know, parties. Uh, the benefit of going to an attorney is that they can more customize the documents to reflect your situation. For example, when I do a power of attorney for a senior citizen, I like to put what I call the HIPAA language in it so that the, the agent under the healthcare, I mean, the agent under the power of attorney can look at your medical records. Yeah, can now, you just talk quickly about what HIPAA is? Some people uh, might not know the definition of it. I could never remember the, the, the correct name because we use HIPAA somewhat. But basically, it's a restriction on the availability of your medical records. In other words, if something happens okay. to you and you're in a hospital and you have not done a, a health care proxy, your husband could not find out or inquire uh, of your medical condition. They can't really tell you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had a case when I started putting my power of attorney. We had a power of attorney, the husband for the wife, but no health care proxy or living will. The wife had cancer and we were inquiring about Medicare and the hospital refused, yeah. legally justified, to discuss the situation with her. That's why I started putting in the uh, power of attorney along with the health care proxy. Okay, so the health care proxy and power of attorney language has to reflect HIPAA. Is that no, what you're no. saying? The, <clears throat> the health care proxy automatically uh, allows your agent to see your medical record. But I can put a situation is that okay. the individuals did a power of attorney, but they didn't do a health care proxy or, or living will. So. Uh, uh, but I, I'm semi-paranoid, so I've started to put HIPAA language into the uh, power of attorney, health care proxy, and sometimes I put it in my trust to make sure that there's somebody who can inquire about the medical condition of an individual. Because I put the client in my position. If I'm ill, can't speak for myself, I want whoever is representing me to have the, the ability to talk to whomever right. to find out my medical you know, condition. So... Um who, who, uh, I'm sorry, what, when would you actually have to do this? Do you only do it when you're sick or when you're starting to get ill or when you're diagnosed with something or should you do it at I, I any think, age? I, I think when you get above 60, everybody should do these documents. You don't know. You know, you could walk out today and fall on the ice. Bingo. You know, and, the, uh, and be incapacitated. So I think it's important to do it. Because the key thing, you have to be competent to do these documents. So I think get them in place, because that way if something comes up, then you've controlled who's going to be making decisions for you, not going to the court. Because if they're not in place <clears throat> and something happens to you, then you're going to have a guardianship. You know, it's costly, time-consuming, and not nearly as flexible. Hmm. Okay, so we've done power of attorney and health care proxy. Next is living wills. Can you define a living will, <clears throat> please? Uh, well, let me go back to the other two for a moment. <clears throat> also, I think when you're picking somebody to represent you on both documents, you should have cascading people. In other words, okay. uh, you pick the, the person that you want or persons, and they have backup and backup. A common problem 
uh, I run into fairly frequently is that a husband and wife have done a power of attorney appointing each other. And then, well, I had a guess I had a case. Wife is in a nursing home, mm. mentally incapacitated. Yeah. Husband has cancer and dies. You know, and with the death of the husband, there's no power of attorney. So coming back to the living will, <clears throat> it's a uh, health care decoration. It's a statement. And uh, it, it's not by statute. Now, the other two documents are in New York statute, but under case law in New York, a living will is recognized. And it allows me to say, uh, if I'm terminal, the level of care I want. I can say, what most people say, just make me comfortable. You know, I, do want, I do not want any heroic activities to keep me alive. But the flip side, I could say, if there's anything out there to keep me alive, wire me in. But mm -hmm. it's a statement. It's a statement that you prepare uh, to, to state your desires if you're terminal and incapacitated. Now, how specific does that have to be? I mean, <clears throat> is there a certain language that the hospitals understand so they know they can't put somebody on a ventilator or they can't give them a certain medication? They just know what it means? Well, no, it, it, uh, it, it depends upon reflecting what you want. It is more or less kind of a standard form where you state it based on incapacitated. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to be artificially you know, kept alive, but then you can be much more um, precise. But one of the problems with being, <laughs> I call it legal weasel words, uh, you need some flexibility. So the person who's making the decision for you uh, has a little bit of latitude. If you're too specific um, in a particular treatment, if something is similar to what you haven't addressed it, you could say, well, then maybe you wanted that. Or you could box yourself in. There was a really bad case coming out of Oregon about three years ago uh, where an individual had a very, very precise living will and health care proxy, and he did not want any form of dehydration. Uh, he contracted a form of pneumonia that only could be treated intravenously. Mm -hmm. uh, and they went into court, and, un and the doctors said if they could treat him, he would live. If not, he would die. And the court found in favor of honoring his precise language that he did not want any form of hydration, which was the right result, but bad for him because he passed on. So you need to have enough um, uh, language in it. Like I, I like to put at the end of my documents um, a little clause where I, I've discussed with the, my, my agent mm -hmm. and they understand my desire because that allows you to get the, at the situation maybe to look at a little bit of it. Because I did that because of my father, you know, you know particularly, because I faced a decision. You know, I know what he, what he wanted, but um, the doctors and I, I looked at his medical records indicated that maybe if we did this, uh, he would survive and be fine. Mm -hmm. And he did. I mean, it, it, was, it was a good call. I mean, I tossed the dice and it, it worked. But, you know, if I looked at the, the per se documents I had, if they're too restrictive, I couldn't have made that decision. I couldn't have said, okay, I think this is, Know, something worth you know doing. So you kind of need to have it, you know, fungible. And that drives lay people sometimes crazy with lawyers. But uh, you need to so, some of these documents have it uh, gets enough fuzz in it that if you need to move this way or that way, uh, you can read the document that way. Okay. So let's talk about who you choose to actually do this. You can do a family member. You can do a friend. You can <coughs> pick an attorney for a health care proxy, right? Yes. Uh, the one person you probably do not want to pick is your attending physician. Because if your attending physician is picked as your health care proxy, then they can't speak, they can't act, you know, for you. Uh, but I, I would predict, typically in most of the cases, you're picking a family member who's going to make the decision. And again, I think it's uh, really important to have backup. For example, let's say I pick my wife. Well, suppose my wife predeceases me. Mm -hmm. I need somebody as a backup. So let's say I pick my son. Well, in my situation was wife, son, daughter, son. That way I'm politically, politically correct. I left nobody out, but I feel very comfortable because I'm this cascading uh, group of people okay. that, that know what I want or I don't want, and more importantly, what I, I don't want done. Now, let's use my family as an example. <clears throat> my parents are both alive. They have seven children. Mm -hmm. So how do they decide which child to start the
the cascading. Uh, <laughs> well, but, I mean, but, but, you know, what, what, what do you fam- think a personality is what I'm saying? Do yeah. you consider the personality of the person? Almost in all families, there's a, there's a leader. I mean, somebody that everybody looks to. You know, and, and normally that's the person you're going to pick. Because um, you want to try to avoid picking. Well, with a healthcare proxy, you, you can only pick one person. With a power of attorney, you can pick multiple people to speak for you. Okay. But it's like sometimes if you get too much of a committee. So mainly I find what most families do, there's somebody in the family who is the decision maker or who has the background uh, to do it. For example, let's say uh, there's a nurse in the family. You know, that may be the person you pick for the healthcare proxy because they understand medical situations and to make that decision. But, but again, I find that most families, there's, there's a person that everybody look, looks at, you know, to make a decision. Okay. So what is the process of filing, um, filing the living will? What, what do they have to do? They do not have to be filed. And, and neither the, none of the documents, uh, power of attorneys, health care proxies, or living wills have to be filed anywhere. Uh, with the power of attorney sometimes, it's advantageous, though, to file with the county. Now, the only time a power of attorney oh. would have to be filed mm-hmm. is when you're transferring real estate. Then it has to be filed you know, with the deed. But I uh, often advise clients <clears throat> to go ahead and file the power of attorney with the uh, county clerk, because that way, if you ever need a certified copy, okay. it's there. it doesn't get lost. Okay, <clears throat> but the other two don't need to be filed with the county or anything mm-hmm. like that. Okay. <clears throat> no, that's why you might want to give it to your doctor, you know, or to make sure your agent has it or, or somebody has it. Okay, so if I'm going to file a living will with you today, how many places do I have to send it to? <clears throat> well, that's up to you. Uh, you might want to give it to your doctor. Uh, you might want to give it to the person who's going to act for you. You know, it d- depends whoever in your circle that you want to know that you have a living will or health care proxy and to make a decision, you know, for you. Okay. Now, do they actually have to have that on hand when they're visiting you in, in, in a medical setting? No, but they're going to have, come up, they're going to, have to come up with a, um, uh, a copy at some point. Okay. Now, <clears throat> when you mention that, I'll say, I, uh, a lot of my the children, my, my clients around the state, and uh, probably at least every other month I may be faxing or sending a copy of one of these documents to uh, a particular health care facility uh, mm-hmm. if somebody's there. Mm-hmm. Now, what I like to do, like most attorneys don't, but I like to do in my office, is do duplicates, originals. So let's say I did a power of attorney, health care proxy, and living will for you, is that I would give you original and copies, and I would keep a copy in, in originals in my file. Okay. So in the event that you lost all of your originals, I have the backup originals. But again, that's just my nature. I like backup. You know, it's no words. Uh, you know, to make sure that okay. we we can always come up with a uh, either original or a copy. So, and we're talking about safe places, right? Not on the coffee table, but some place where <clears throat> it's not going to be damaged by water or anything like that, right? Yes, and one of the places that is is not advantageous typically is a safety deposit box with a bank. Oh. Because you have to get in to open it up. You know, so if it's in your name and you're incapacitated, uh, it's a procedure. So it's better to have a um, uh, a cabinet or some place. But, but again, come to documents. So that's why in my office I keep uh, originals along with giving you original. Because hopefully you don't lose your originals and I don't lose mine, you know, at the same same time. Because mm-hmm. I've had people, I've had a little run uh, where I've done documents back in the 80s and somebody you know, coming in and uh, needing to get an original or a copy lately, you know, the, uh, unfortunately I'm like a pat rack, you know, where I, I keep everything. Now, I'm just curious, are most, is most of the storage digital in law firms or do you actually have file cabinets where you're pulling drawers out? <coughs> well, I'm from, I'm from the old school. You know, the, I'm tech, technologically challenged, so I have copies and paper. Uh, however, I have uh, moved up a little bit where I do keep um, uh, the drafts or, or uh, the final documents on uh, on my computer, and I, I store them on a, 
a disc, but that's only the draft. What's really is okay. important is coming up with a signed, signed. copy right. or the original. You know, and uh, um, at some point, probably most firms would go to more digital. Um, yeah, but, but then they'd have to scan it after everything yeah. was signed. So that makes another complication, doesn't <clears throat> it? All right. Um, lastly, why don't we talk about trusts? How many different kinds of trusts are there? Before we do that, let me come back. I don't think I mentioned with, with, with the power of attorney, not the healthcare proxy living will. They come in three varieties, durable, oh. non-durable, and spring and durable. Okay, yes. Now, now what, what's important, and one of the problems going back to the question, can you do it yourself? A tendency that happens, if you go to a stationary store, the person does a non-durable power of attorney. And the problem with that, if you lose capacity, your power of attorney becomes ineffective. So you need to make sure it's a durable power of attorney. Okay. Onto it. Trust, that, that's a broad field. But let's uh, limit it to just living trust or what we call in vivo trust, trust created during lifetime. And they come in basically two varieties, revocable and irrevocable. Okay. All right, why don't you start with revocable? Well, a revo well let me, let me um, yeah, uh, they're very similar. You know, in fact, it's basically one word can change the nature of the trust. This trust is irrevo irrevocable or this trust is revocable. You know, but basically a trust is a business entity. Uh, and I think it's easier for people to understand how a trust works. It's a business entity very similar to a corporation or a limited liability company. Okay. Uh, the, the trust could own the library. They could manage the library. Mm -hmm. And a lot of property in the United States is managed through trust. Many people think it's a uh, non-acting you know, entity that receives something and, and doesn't do very much. Um, the revocable trust, you can revoke at will. Now, what you can create today, fund it, and tomorrow you get upset, you can revoke it, and the trust is, is gone. Okay. I'm, I personally, for seniors, do not favor revocable trust, and because of Alzheimer's. There is a period of time okay. when somebody becomes a little bit paranoid and they rip up everything. They, they rip oh. up their power of attorney, they rip up their health care proxy, they rip up their trust. I lean toward the irrevocable trust, because you can craft that trust to be nearly as flexible as a revocable trust and still achieve the trust staying in uh, place if you get a little bit paranoid. And, and the two main powers you okay. can keep over it is the limited power of appointment and the power to change trustees. Okay. Now, do trusts include uh, either properties or bank accounts, you know, money in bank accounts? All of the above. All of that? They can buy gold bullion, they can own land, uh, mutual funds, uh, real property, they can buy and sell, you know, and trade. It, it's all with the trust powers. The key thing, Peggy, I think uh, coming back again, when somebody's talking about trust, it's all in the drafting, you know, and the, uh, uh, that's why they tend to be a bit long. You, you need to have functional language to allow the trustee to, to act. You know, and basically, if you, most trusts are set up so that the trustee can do everything that you can do with an asset, buy, sell, and trade in that area. Okay, so let's say I'm a person that's named in somebody's trust. As Am I, am I the trustee or the well, well, grantor, or what am I? Well, well there's, there's three people. The grantor, trustee, and beneficiary. Oh. Okay, the grantor okay. is the person that creates a trust. And sometimes they call it settlor. There, there's different terminologies. I'm just using grantor because I like that. But the, um, so that's the person that signs the trust. Now, that, under New York law, that person can be grantor, beneficiary, and trustee of the trust. So they can be the whole show, as with a single okay. person corporation. It's very, very similar to that. The beneficiary has a beneficiary, uh, a beneficiary interest in the trust. The trust exists for them, I mean, uh, you know, however it's going to be. But they can't do anything to it, right? Uh, unless some power is given them. Okay. But but the power, but but the basic of the trust exists for them, you know, and to provide whatever benefit that you want to provide. The trustee is the person who 
runs the trust. Runs it. Okay. Now, now, a big question that comes up many times I'm doing the trust, um, I want to set up a trust with my daughter, you know, and, the, uh, uh, and I want her to be trustee of her trust. Uh, if she gets divorced, uh, can the ex-husband, to become ex-husband, oh because he's trustee, have a claim against the trust because he's trustee? And the answer is no. Because she's trustee of the trust, she has a fiduciary duty to, to manage the trust. But she is not the owner of the trust. It's the beneficiary who is the owner of the trust. Um, so, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, you know, that and, makes sense. Yeah, and of course, when I talk to clients many times, I said this, to me, there's three reasons why you want to do a trust. Avoiding the probate, asset management, and asset protection. For the first two, the irrevocable trust and the irre irrevocable trust do the same. But for asset protection, you need to have an irrevocable trust. Okay. Now, let's talk about health care settings. Uh, when, when would a trust come into play um, in a health care setting? Well, today, if you're concerned about protecting assets you know, and going to a nursing home, oh, nursing the trust home. needs to be okay. set up five years before, um, uh, for five years now. There's a five-year look-back period. Mm -hmm. uh, but trust is still alive and well in that setting. You still do, I, I call it an asset protection trust. Some people call it a Medicaid trust, but you still do trust that protect assets if you go into a nursing home, except the lead time is five years. But it's the same thing if you want to give a piece of property away. Let's say your mom was worried about going into a nursing home. If she gives you a piece of property, the look back period is five years. If she sets up a trust, look here, the look back period is five years. Oh, the big okay. difference between the two, let's say somebody produced money, if she sets up the trust, then the income is fully available to her, you know, until she actually goes into the, uh, you know, the nursing home. Uh, but a trust, but but I wouldn't do a trust just for that issue. I mean, I would ask all three questions because one thing we're sure of is probate. I mean, uh, we're going to pass on sooner or later. So if you want to avoid probate, then a trust is, is excellent. Mm -hmm. The next one is asset management, and from where I sit, and I, I do for about playing for senior citizens, this is a very precarious period of time because uh, first of all, many seniors are vulnerable with people coming and trying to take advantage of them. Mm -hmm. you know, and also, um, when they get to a certain age, we're not, uh, we still may be competent, but we may not be at the top of our game, energy-wise and et cetera. The trust works nice. We bring a younger, typically a family member in, to help manage the trust for us or, or with us. But I, I call it like circling the wagons. Uh, right. If they're going to try to get the senior, they got to get through the trustee. You know, and so it's, it becomes asset protect, protective there. Then finally, uh, if the trust is set up, Property, uh, not only nursing home, but let's say uh, there's a bad accident or different things happen, mm -hmm. the, the assets are protect, protected. But a big one I run into, uh, which I find revolting many times, is people trying to predators trying to take advantage of a senior citizen. You know, and uh, right. it actually happened in my own family. We had a trust set up. My father and I were co-trustees, and uh, a poor man, he, he just gets out of the hospital the day after. Some people came and they put a lot of, three of them, they put a lot of pressure on him, you know, and he signed this document uh, that pertained to a piece of property we uh -oh. owned. And the, uh, the problem was, from their standpoint, is that it took two people, myself and my father, you know, and oh. uh, so, so in other words, it was uh, going. So yeah. You didn't sign it, so it wasn't valid. Not valid. Well, I, I knew it when I got home. If it, it was a problem in my family, everybody called, if, if I heard the word Bobby, there's a problem. So I came home that day, my father said, Bobby, I got to speak to you. You know, and the, uh, mm. uh, but because of their trust. So I, I, but I find from the asset management standpoint, uh, uh, it's a good reason to do it. But most people won't do it for that. But the, the main thing is that a trust can be a, a very flexible. They also, a trust kind of uh, has a dual role. It's something that deals with assets during a lifetime, and it deals with disposing of your assets after death, similar to a will. So it's a substitute for a will. But also, it's a good asset management uh, vehicle during lifetime. So a power of attorney and a trust put together generally is extremely effective asset management tools okay. during lifetime. But then at death, it disposes of your estate without going through probate. So trusts, they allow, let's say, um, the grantor and the beneficiary to withdraw, or maybe the trustee has to maybe pay a bill or something like that. Yeah, all, they all can the do above. That, it's, right? it's, it's all how you draft it, but typically, let's take the asset protection. You know, trust is going to be discretionary, <clears in> the, <throat> so you get the discretionary power of the trustee 
to, to make distributions. And you can authorize them in two ways, either give it to the beneficiary or to pay it directly. Now that's where the okay. power to change trustee becomes very important. Let's say I appoint you as a trust. Well, let's say I, I, I appoint my, my son as a uh, trustee of my trust, mm -hmm. you know, and I uh, get this urge to do a worldwide uh, tour. You know, I said to son, uh -oh. cut me a check, and he says, ah, I don't know if I want to do that date or, date or not. If I got my uh, power to change trustee, I can say, sayonara, I put my daughter in, because I know she's going to write the check. But more importantly, typically, if something happens to my son, I can appoint somebody else. But there are certain powers you can have on a trust to give you a lot of flexibility and control without affecting the integrity of the trust. So again, okay. it's, it's all in the drafting. But coming back, for example, if you're concerned about going to a nursing home, then the trust would be a income only trust. If you're doing it for other reasons, then typically the beneficiary has a right to uh, income in principle. For example, uh, okay. if I, I was doing an inheritance trust, in other words, I'm receiving inheritance from my parents, which is treated as a third party trust, my parents can give me in that trust accessibility to both principal and income. But if I'm doing a trust for myself and I'm worried about the nursing home, then I'm going to limit my interest to income only. So again, it's all in the drafting. Okay. So basically, you have to, as a lawyer, you find out what their specific needs are, whether they're going into a nursing home, how many children they have, who they trust, mm -hmm. and you just work it from there. Yeah, it's estate planning. You sit down, the same as drafting a will or any other thing. You have a discussion. Um, you find out what the person's objectives are and what okay. they want to accomplish, and then you put it together. And, you know, the uh, probably, um, in my attitude, there's probably a 50% probability of somebody going into you know, a nursing home. So that should not be the driving force. It should be a consideration, but not one of the main driving forces. But it's an important thing to look at because it can devastate an estate. Right. And so typically a properly drafted trust basically accomplishes most of the objectives. Avoiding probate, asset management, and God forbid the nursing home comes up on the mm -hmm. radar screen, the assets are protected if you're through, you know, the appropriate waiting period. Okay, and I'm assuming you must need an attorney to do that, right? To do a trust? Uh, well, no, you can get a form and so forth. I mean, there are different aspects, but, oh, okay. you're, but you're not going you're you're to get it... Um, uh, uh, it, it, this type of trust, other trusts, are not off the self. And besides that, it needs to be customized. I, <laughs> I, a number of years ago, I, I thought this gentleman was going to punch me. He was an English professor. He had drafted his own trust, and it turned out I was the fourth attorney. His wife had Alzheimer's, and he wanted to protect the assets if she went to the nursing home. And misunderstanding legal jargon, he had did, did just the opposite uh -oh. in the trust because the only expenditures the trust could make was for medical care you know and uh -oh. uh, so when he came in of course he was really upset because he misdrafted it you know whereas instead of protecting the assets he actually made him vulnerable and he didn't have any uh, escape hatches no limited power of appointment uh, no disclaimer and other things like, and a lot of these trusts if you talk to attorneys who do a lot of trust there's some fuzzy language that's put in uh, so you got some flexibility because you might want to sell it down. Now, under New York law, if, every, if you do an irrevocable trust and everybody agrees, you can, uh, you can terminate it, amend it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, modify it. But the problem with some of these situations is, in this case, uh, the wife lacked capacity to, you know, to agree, so you're stuck with it. But there's other clauses you can slip in that will give the trustee um, ability to, uh, w within the legal realm, to make some modifications or changes. Okay. All right. Anything you, else you want to mention before we close? Well, I, I think going back, the, 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 the three big main documents, power of attorney, health care proxy, living will, they're inexpensive to do. Mm -hmm. They retain control and they avoid you having to go to a guardianship in the event that you lose capacity. Okay. And I think the trust don't no, ties into it, but they, they are the the main little, I got the little documents that do. Okay. All right. So uh, there's one thing I want to <coughs> mention, which is uh, the Westlaw database. It's a legal reference database, which uh, the library, the county library has available in-house. 
and their um, computers. Uh, we also have a legal form database online at www.colony.org slash library. You go to online databases and then you'll see the legal form database. So they might be able to find some of the forms in the legal form database. Um, last thing is we want to mention uh, your firm's website. Go ahead. Uh, it's uh, Wolf with two Fs, uh, W-O-L-F-F at law dot com. Okay. And the phone number, please. Uh, area code 518-271-0801. Okay. And you have actually done programs in the Colony Library in the past. Mm -hmm. um, can you just mention some of the subjects that you've covered? Oh, what, what I did was uh, when to start taking Social Security. Um, okay. Which was, a, it, it, I mean, I'm still doing some more seminars on that. Uh, I did one here uh, discussing, uh, I call it do's and don'ts, excuse me, <coughs> of estate planning, uh, of dealing with IRAs. Yes, because I hope to do some other, uh, uh, there's a couple other workshops I'd like to do. One is the, uh, they, they just changed the required minimum distribution rules, uh, which, uh, you know, and the reason of our government is very simple, but simple is very complex. Uh, for okay. 2009, and there's a lot of other little changes going. One thing nice about tax law and the Medicaid law, but particularly tax law, and particularly the retirement area, they're always changing the rules. Right. Got to keep us on our toes, right? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming in. Well, thank you, Peggy, for having me here. It's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thanks for watching. We hope to see you next time on Focus on Health.